Okay, so uh, we'll quickly move on to the panel discussion and I won't take time. Uh, I'll just quickly introduce our moderator of the discussion, Mr. Arun Malhotra. He is an auto industry veteran, a former managing director of Nissan Motor India, a visiting faculty at some of India's most prominent uh, educational institutions currently. Mr. Malhotra brings in over three decades of experience in the auto sector. And now I would like to invite him over for the uh, panel discussion on Vision 2030. Mr. Malhotra, over to you. Thanks you, uh, Dibashu. Uh, it's a pleasure and privilege to be, to be part of this uh, conclave. And the topic today is a very interesting topic. We are talking of Vision 2030. Can EV two-wheelers become the norm of the country in 2030? Uh, we are in 2021. You know, before we talk of it becoming a norm, let's slightly step back. The last financial year, which is just over, we hardly sold about 1,45,000 EV two-wheelers. We just contributed 1% of the total two-wheeler volume. But having said that, there's no point for being dejected or demoralized or demotivated on this count because there's a lot of action happening now. And when we are talking of this becoming a norm by 2030, Clearly, we would assume that at least 30% minimum of vehicles sold should be EV two-wheelers. And if you assume the market last year was 15 million, it was 21 million about two years back. So on a conservative basis, if we move to a figure of 30 million in the financial year 2030, we should assume minimum a 10 million numbers, which is a huge growth of what we've done last year, over one like 40,000, but there are a lot of positives which are happening. Clearly, there are a lot of positive uh, developments which are happening. Uh, one, which is a blessing in disguise, the fuel price is going up, petrol touching, scoring centuries, unlike our cricket batsman was struggling in England. You have also a lot of initiatives by the government, Niti Aayog's initiatives in terms of government, infrastructure, manufacturers gearing up the plans, new manufacturers coming in, and there is a positive buzz around it. But that's the positive buzz. Ultimately, the announcements, pronouncements of the buzz have to be converted to action. And we'll be discussing this with our eminent panelists. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Sinha, who is the advisor in Niti Aayog, a key person. Already a lot of things have happened on the Niti Aayog front. So welcome to him, Mr. Soyendra Gill. If I call him the, uh, you know, it won't be a, something, uh, something very difficult to say. I mean, I would say it's a very simple thing. He's like the father of EV two-wheelers in India. He's driving it. He's a global CEO of Hero Electric and also the Director General of Society of Manufacturer of Electric Vehicles. Then we have Mr. Jay Kumar, who's a group president and MD Value. Value is a company which is making major forays into the entire ecosystem of auto ancillaries. And there's a lot happening there. We'd like to hear from him. Mr. Karthik Gopal, he's a CMAV specialist. He's had his, he has done his work in the EV industry and he's now an advisor in the International Finance Corporation with special focus on EV to EVs and two wheelers. And last but not the least is Arvind Sanka, who's a co-founder of Rapido. And that's the major foray. And I was talking to him, they're talking of covering virtually every district of the country through commercial two wheelers application. So a very distinguished panel. The first session before we move to forward, forward gear, we would like to take stock shortly and uh, take about three minutes from each panelist. Where do we stand today? When we say we stand today, what on 15th June, where do we stand today? And special reference to the last four, five months in, the, in this ecosystem of EV two-wheelers. And uh, I'll go straight to Mr. Sohinder Gill. So Mr. Sohinder Gill, your status, your understanding of the present status, we'll talk on the future later, and special reference to what has happened in the last three months. Over to Mr. Gill. Thank you, Arun. And uh, the th three to four months status <laughs> is divided into two parts. The first two months were lost by the industry, again, due to network shutdown totally. And the recovery started happening in the last one and a half, two months. The good part is uh, the run rate of the last two months is around one and a half to two times of the corresponding period of the previous year. So from that point of view, we believe that if COVID doesn't hit us bad as it has earlier in the first two months, this industry certainly is going to witness a 100% growth this year. FY previous to FY this year. So from that point of view, green shoots are being seen, but there is a sort of a major churning happening here, which means due to the policy interventions so greatly done by Niti Aayog and DHI, 
there is a lot of churning happening in 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 OEMs in their products, and suddenly there are some shortages also that have come up because some products have started selling very well. So the industry has to come out of that. They have to create sort of variants of products which are suiting more and more subsidy, which will take some time. So that could be the only lull in between. But I still strongly believe that we would end up doing hundred percent more than previous year. So it's going to be hundred percent growth. So it's a lot of positive and reassuring words from Mr. Gill, and uh, as he mentioned that uh, clearly we're talking about doubling volumes. It may be low base, but it's a very very positive development. As he mentioned, the run rate has gone up. Uh, over to Mr. Sena. Mr. Sena, a lot of accolades are being given to Niti Aayog. Somehow they've gone from the first year straight to the fourth year. I mean, last three four months. From your perspective, because you represent the government policy think tank and even action tank, where are we today? And especially with reference what has happened in the last three months. We'll move to forward future in later, but just to understand from you, from the understanding of Niti Aayog. Uh, well, the interventions that have come about in last one month, I would say, one and a half months kind of thing. Precisely June will definitely go a long way in just showcasing as the major important month for in the history of electric mobility, when we have re-strategized the entire FAME 2, we have extended FAME 2, and of course, the national flagship scheme of ACC PLI that has also been, I mean, that has been announced, it is likely to be positioned soon. So yes, now you say where exactly we are. Now I will say a little short of point of inflection. So just on the staircase, moving to the springboard before the great leap. That is precisely where we are. So very well said, uh, uh, Mr. Sena. We are reaching the point of inflection. And as you mentioned, the last one month has been a month of a lot of positive developments, both from the central government, Niti Aayog, state governments, the PLI scheme. And you say it's a misty dawn, I would say, but it's a new dawn, if I would take uh, put words in Mr. Uh, Sena's mouth. But coming to Mr. Chekhovar, you know, looking at the entire ecosystem, because, you know, a lot of people have this apprehension that uh, if we make EVs, we will become dependent on foreign imports. The make in India thing will go down. So there's a lot of action that what's happening that how can we kickstart the ecosystem of the entire auto ancillary, whether in terms of import substitution, quality improvement, make in India, higher Indianization. So... You represent value, but I'm, I'm sure you have a vast perspective on what's happening in the entire industry. So what's the action happening in the last three months and today? And you can, can us, you give us a clear bird's eye view of this. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Malhotra. Uh, if you see the, the, the last few months, uh, despite the pandemic, uh, you can see that there are a lot of developments still happening. Many discussions on new uh, RFQs, with the OEMs, I'm, I'm talking with the, the perspective uh, perspective from the auto component industry. So uh, the developments are happening, new business awards are being done. And uh, as an uh, you know electric powertrain uh, system and also the uh, power electronics, investments are happening uh, with the, both the tire ones and tire twos. Now, uh, uh, if you look at the the localization, uh, what, you know, how much you make in India, it all uh, depends on uh, what is the volume. So there's a lot of optimism with the, uh, with the uh, our panel members mentioning about the FAME 2 revised uh, scheme, which is a very encouraging trend, which will definitely help in accelerating the EV penetration, especially the two-wheelers penetration in the market. And this... Uh, is giving a lot of optimism for the component manufacturers as well. So, so what we have been thinking is we do a localization in a phased manner. We kind of a wait and watch kind of a situation where we will be able to invest step by step over a period of time as we see the growth in the EV segment. As you also mentioned that uh, the EV is definitely going to grow to up to 30% or I, I, with this new scheme, even it can go up to 50%. So these are all uh, the things that, that is giving a lot of optimism. But what is the detrimental factor today is the initial 
buying cost of the vehicle. So something has to be done there, where which will help uh, in uh, much easier penetration uh, and, and the end consumer really going for it. So uh, as Mr. Jaguar mentioned, uh, there are some investments clearly going on and companies I think are moving from wait and watch to some walk, watch and walk and ultimately they have to run. And uh, as he put it, and this is a point we'll be discussing that the initial price, uh, the initial price of EV two wheelers have to be more affordable in times to come. And that we'll be discussing on that. But clearly if you look at the government policy of the 15 lakhs vehicles, they're nearly earmarked under the frame two policy, two third were nearly two wheelers. So obviously the government's focus and the entire focus is on two wheelers. Now, coming to Mr. Karthik uh, Gobal, you've been seeing the EV two-wheeler space with great detail in the recent past. And now you are advising also not only in India and other developing countries through IFCI. How do you see what's happening? And let's take from you a view India versus other developing countries. Are we running ahead? Are we at the same pace or we are lagging behind? Thank you. Uh, very interesting question. So, um... Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I think globally, I would very, um, obviously China is, is leading the pack when it comes to uh, electric vehicle technology deployment and overall uh, adoption. So if I exclude China and look at the rest of the developing world, um, I would, and, and I do not say this with any um, um, specific angle, but I do strongly see that India is way ahead of a lot of other developing countries. And this comes at from multiple perspectives. So if we look at starting from the policy perspective today, we are in FAME 2 is in its second iteration of the policy. We started with the NEMMP 2020, which was announced as an intent in, in 2011. The FAME scheme was actually, FAME 1 scheme was actually launched, I think, in 2013. FAME 2 came in and now we have extended that. We have added on the PLI scheme to support manufacturing. Um, so I think the whole journey of evol evolution of policy has been very strong and way ahead of the curve in many other developing countries. So that, especially in two wheelers today, if I look at where are the big markets globally, it is obviously India is the biggest market outside of China. And then you have countries in uh, Southeast Asia uh, and some in, in Africa. These are the major uh, main markets for two-wheelers. In all of these markets, I think at least from a policy perspective, we are far more mature and uh, progressive uh, than many of the other markets. I would say that Thailand has been uh, doing a lot of work on the supporting the manufacturing side, but again, it, it's not matched equally from the demand generation side, so there is a little bit of a, a, a space to be filled up. So that's policy. Then obviously on the on the product development side, I think this is a vibrant market today. You have the market leader here in the uh, in the in the panelists. Uh, there are, and I'm sure he's having a, a good competition. Really that. <laughs> yes, so a lot of good competition, which is a very healthy sign. I think it is basically a mark of confidence in the market. So I think again, so the perspective of having indigenous homegrown. OEMs who are building products for the local markets. Again, I think we are doing quite good. I think definitely that's something. And I think that the next phase of the, when, how do you deepen we'll that? We'll talk of the next phase. We'll just talking, taking stock presently. Right. No, I, yeah. So just, I think, I think of course, uh, both from a manufacturing perspective and policy perspective, it's great. Demand, demands incentives, same started with that. So overall, I think these are some of the great positives that I see in the Indian context. And the other countries are also looking at uh, India to learn from here and and uh, build in their own local markets as well. Thank you. So a lot of reassuring words from Mr. Karthik, but uh, he's very conveniently excluded China. He says we are not competing. China is far ahead. China is like the Amitabh Bachchan of 2080, 1 to 10 China, 1 to 10 Amitabh Bachchan, then Lumber 11, Vinod Karna. So he excluded that. But he says we are better. But one thing we must keep in mind, we are uh, the largest market of two wheelers and we are still a large market even for exports. So uh, we cannot become complacent by, by competing with countries like Thailand and Indonesia. So a lot of good things are happening, but reassuring to know that we are moving ahead. And coming to uh, Arvind uh, Ranka, who's co-finder for Rapido. You know, if we have to go, go from this figure of 1.5 lakhs of last year, approximately, and even if we take a conservative basis, you want to go to a 
10 million weight to 100 lakhs. I mean, you could grow 66 times. So, so the pace, like the name of your company, has to be very, very rapid. Hmm? Very, very rapid. It has to be rapid or to the power of something. I don't know what it has to be. But coming from your perspective, commercial application of two wheelers, we hear a lot of things. Is there something happening on ground of commercial application, whether in terms of last mile connectivity or whether in terms of passenger movement? Is there something happening on the commercial two wheeler landscape? Yeah, uh, thanks, Arun, for having me. Uh, I'll tell you a couple of perspectives from an operator side of it, and then maybe a consumer who is buying the uh, commercial vehicle for electric. I think one of the major reason is both operators want to become profitable. Uh, so given either in aggregators like us or food, food ordering platforms or, uh, or e-commerce companies. So, and they can only become if um, the end consumer, which in our case can be a captains or maybe a driver partners, start making more money. Uh, and uh, that can only happen if their fuel cost, which is 25% of the cost that they bear, uh, goes down. So that is one of the major reason. And definitely I would say a year back, we hardly used to have any electric vehicles on our platform. But recently we started with 500 vehicles in just one city. Uh, and now we have plans for introducing 4,000 to 5,000 vehicles in the course of next six months. So, I, and here it's also happening because the end user or our, our driver partners or captains are interested to take it because they see they're saving a lot of money because of moving to electric. I think, um, and to make this acceleration of 150,000 to a million, I think majority of the initial push can only happen from commercial use case. Okay. <laughs> so, savings, so, very because good. Savings are, because the savings are very high. I mean, for an individuals who are <laughs> buying an electric versus a commercial use case, the savings are exponential. I mean, from, uh, in a personal still, um, I think it's, we are still not in the savings as a mindset. It's still uh, more from, not from saving money, but more from an environmental point of view. But for a commercial use case, the savings are like within six months to eight okay. months, uh, the savings are like visible for people to shift from petrol to electric. So great. Uh, so you believe that in commercial, since the biggest one of the challenges in two wheelers have been that, uh, how do you get that break even? How do you get that? Uh, break even faster and uh, as you believe as uh, Arvind believes in commercial application you're going to get the break even faster so there the fast pace pace could be much faster mm -hmm. now let's shift gear and I think we want to move to the future and we're talking of challenges and opportunities so I'm a figure of 10 million is just a rough figure I'm not saying we debate on that but the point is it has to become the norm and we are just a, a baby or I would say not even a baby we are an infant at this point of time as far as even the contribution was concerned. And we have to look at the challenges and opportunities. Now, there will be a lot of challenges. I mean, if we had stepped back and we had talked in 2017, I mean, the figures we had talked in 2021, we are nowhere near there. So obviously something has not gone right. So we can't, we need to not only learn from the past, but we have to move forward. Mr. Gill, you have been, not only from your company's perspective, but from the industry association, I know you have been driving it a lot there. So. We want your frank, free, fearless view. What are the challenges and what are the opportunities and how we can overcome those? I mean, we have to really move at a fast pace. So from you, <laughs> straight to you, sir. Yeah, Arun. Uh, currently, where we are sitting is uh, just a recent positive happening. One is policy. Second is petrol prices. These two things have changed. But just if you even factor those, a consumer who wants to buy an electric when he enters a showroom for every one reason that he wants to buy there is one reason that he doesn't want to buy today so today's situation is still like that so affordability has come into play so that is an attraction when he's entering the showroom but behind that the negativity of the past of substandard products in the market giving a negative word of mouth is still lurking in his mind the resale value quotient is again something he says for an Indian consumer is so very important. The predictability of performance of battery and the cost of battery replacement is one more thing. And also on the, uh, on the uh, servicing of the vehicle. When he goes outside and he finds that no roadside mechanic is able to uh, do anything about it if something goes wrong. So there are myriad factors which are still lurking in his mind, which somehow the guy is suspicious of electric mobility today. 
so if you say challenges for an individual these challenges will have to be removed or they will automatically get removed so some of them will automatically get removed because of scale because of presence of many many vehicles in high density <clears> on the road which will create a positive word of mouth and some of them will come out of technology involvement uh, evolvement and some of them will have to be a lot of communication and education done to the customer so it's a time now to put this seven eight challenges and find solutions to them perhaps for example servicing of vehicle is such important but so easy to do the whole country all the mechanics on the road side perhaps many of them to have to start learning the electronics part of it so somebody has to do it like smbv we are trying to do it asd is trying to do it so government has to try and push the conversion of mechanical maintenance to electronic maintenance similarly simple charging infrastructure not an elaborate not a costly one so that you can find a charging point somewhere just in case of the range anxiety which sometimes hits in but rarely is really required but for that one socket is required in the realm of nearby distance where one guy feels it my daughter son or my father is on a scooter and it is 10 in the night or 6 in the morning there is some possibility of not begging for a power power point but something that he can pay and get it done on the battery replacement cost it's obviously a natural curve and i believe in times to come batteries will be much more cheaper not so much as bloomberg says but surely they follow a path of curve of 10% year on year type of a reduction which is good enough in 3 to 4 years more important than that is unpredictability of behavior of battery india has a lot to do on packaging of cells not only creation of cells because the thermal management part of it is hitting us bad in two wheelers especially two wheelers are hot jackets of high temperatures of 65 degrees within the battery compartments in most part of the countries during peak summer and that's a giant killer for batteries so today the chemistry that's being tried out used by many manufacturer is really a borrowed chemistry borrowed technology it lacks thermal dynamics it lacks lot of balancing it lot lot of safety features that leads not to even accidents or unpredictability behavior of the battery creating a negativity on the running costs again instead of lasting for 5 years battery lasts for 1 year 1 and a half year 2 years so if i put so many of them together we have to treat all of them one by one and the education and awareness is a job with mr sina and i have to do together perhaps like the the government has to do it the association has to do it hero has to do it but we have to really bombard now electric two wheeler aapki jeb ke liye achhi desh ke liye achhi so that quotient has to come so like that i would go on and on but i would believe as times come these challenges will be the demolished automatically or will be proactively taken care by manufacturers and that is a time when the inflection will come i believe it is still two years away so you know it was mentioned by i mean mr um, sena did mention about the inflection point being nearby uh, mr gill has given us another gill has given a date that inflection point is still two years away so if we are talking of two years away we are already in 2023 so it's like a one day match we already lost 15 overs so you're asking rate does really go up dramatically on them but coming to mr sena there are a lot of positive developments the in, the incentives has been made by 50% more on electric two wheeler especially there is this extension because otherwise it used to happen government policies come then the new policy takes six months to come so there's a, there's a sense of uncertainty which is there but i think what mr uh, he has mentioned is the i would if i put it the four rs the right price which i think the industry has to work in because the right price doesn't mean only the initial price but also means the financing which is a big challenge today i mean which is a uh, a thing which nobody wants to talk very strongly but financing getting is not an easy task so right price range reach and the reassurance factor reassurance reliability that's a factor which is coming in and as he said is ki hum aapke sath hain if i put it a a sharukh khan movie you know that main hu na hum hai na government bhi hai industry bhi hai sab sab hai so looking at that and we have a complex situation because we have a, a central policy then state governments have their own ways of looking at things so how do you combine that and you keep it from i won't say it's a it's a some a cacophony at the moment i won't say that but how do you make it to do as symphony like what zubin mehta does so mr sena since you have to play the role of a zubin mehta you are the symphony maker how do you think what the government should do and what you can say from the behalf of the government it is doing 
No, orchestration is definitely one of the prime role of the government, basically acting as a catalyzer. <clears throat> Let me put it this way that as of now, most of the states have been sensitized about it. Today's position is that almost 13 states are having, they've already notified their policies. 12 states are almost, uh, their position is that is a draft stage and it is likely to be finalized very soon. So that adds up to 25, of course, states and union territories combined together. That is one area. And among these states, all the states, there is a it is very aspirational desire for them. That is the reason why in Goa, I was told that a two-wheeler, an ICE two-wheeler is almost, I mean, an electric two-wheeler is almost equal to or even less than the ICE home work because they have straight away given 10,000 rupees extra over and above what fame is get, getting, what they're getting on fame. So that is there. <clears throat> so you rightly mentioned, Mr. Gill rightly mentioned that uh, uh, other than pricing, other issues are there. Charging infrastructure, that entire ecosystem, that is one. Better technology, how to induct better technology so that it becomes more reliable, that is the second one. Awareness, yes, it has to go in a big way. And as Mr. Gill rightly said, that uh, you can serve the country. And that too, you can, it is JF Kiliachi, what you said, Mr. Gill? JF Kiliachi? That has to be added because that anxiety should not be in his mind. So that is there. So what I, I can only tell you that in times to come, you will keep on listening good news from the government side as far as from the policy support will always be there. So that, that assurance, you can take it. We will keep on doing, we will keep on revisiting our own systems, our own policies, recalibrating them so that it is in a position to help create that ecosystem so that the point of inflection comes. That is the reason why today you see as many as what? 30 plus models of two wheelers are available. And almost once in say 15 days or in a month, I find in my room some new investor or even the existing one who wants to diversify into the area of two-wheeler. We are not only the biggest market of two-wheeler, we are the greatest manufacturer of two-wheeler also. And these new investors, new models, they are coming in. They are not only concentrating themselves on the domestic market, they are thinking beyond that. They are thinking about the Eastern European market kind of thing. And some of them do say, that their supply chain that they are going to establish, that will be more robust, more economical, more remunerative than what we think of Amitabh Bachchan, that is China is. And even making of Amitabh Bachchan take, has taken a lot of years, 2008, nine kind of thing, that is when they started. And they had their own problems. When the first scheme that they had floated, which was a major, major, it just crashed into it what they call 10 cities, 1,000 vehicles. It, it did not work. So they also, I mean, in a country like China, where all of us can always debate how much of democracy is there, in, a, in that ecosystem also, they have taken a lot of time. So we have got our own uh, pace, but definitely I would say that it's a, it's a good one, it's a strong one. And the new things that are likely to be there, that is awareness, charging infrastructure, uh, and advanced technology, yes. So uh, a lot of music to the ears. I mean, Mr. Zane is saying that one side, clearly government policies are moving ahead. And he says, like the Santa Claus, there'll be more goodies coming for the industry and for the customers, I believe. Mr. Zane, you and Niti Aayog and the government has to play the role of a Santa Claus, which has shown somewhat in the last one month. But what you have mentioned also is that it's not only a domestic market, but export market. One, one question to you, Rajanda, to you is, you know, you talked of Goa. Goa is great. But Goa is still a very small, microscopic minority of the country. I mean, it represents us two Lok Sabha seats out of 550. They're the big states like the, where the two-wheeler markets are. UP, MP, Bihar, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Andhra, Telangana. How do we ensure that whatever good practices happen in a Delhi or a Goa or happen whatever we announced in Gujarat, how can we get it that the same policies come immediately across to other states? 
I know it's not an easy question. We've got a federal structure, but just one answer on that point. Should I? Should I handle that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. The question is to you. I'm telling you, we have already told, even states are quite aware of that. Mm -hmm. They have simply said they keep on visiting the policies of the other states because they are aware that it is the time for the great grand challenges only. No investor is going to come until you are ready to give him the best. So they keep on finding what is going on at the other state and whatever gap is there, they want to make it up for the gap. Goa is one story. Andhra Pradesh, Telangana is another one. I, I have got a information that yesterday or the day before yesterday only, they have given, they have asked EESL, I'm sorry, CESL, that is another subsidy of EESL, to give them 25,000 straight away to arrange for 25,000 two wheelers for their employees. And what a wonderful leasing scheme that they have come out with for their own employees. That is what is happening in Andhra Telangana kind of thing. Similarly in Kerala. So states and states are picking up. Last week I was with uh, Himachal. The industry secretary was there, the principal secretary of industry was there, and then uh, the transport sector was there. They were saying that they want three cities, that is Baddi, and uh, Baddi was one, Shimla was another one, and probably Dharamshala, or I'm getting mixed up, Dharamshala, or Kulu, one of these three, two. So they want all these three cities to be completely electric. What I'm trying to emphasize upon is see what an aspirational viewpoint of these states are. They are quite aware what is going on in other Places that is the reason why they are trying to work out a models like that so that they are able to uh, attract the investors. So clearly, it's a it's a positive movement, and this, the developments that are happening in Goa or may happen in Delhi or now you said in is proving to be a catalyst. And uh, you know, we mentioned Amitabh Bachchan. When I remember Amitabh Bachchan in the first four years of his career, he started his career in two thousand, sorry, nineteen sixty nine. But in the first 14 films, we didn't do really make a mark. But once he gained momentum in 73, he's never looked back. So I hope the EV Amitabh Bachchan story <laughs> at series services in the EV industry also. So that's something, a good hope point of view. Coming to Mr. Jaikumar, you know, there's a lot of being said from the customer end. But, you know, there are, a lot of comp there are a lot of issues when I talk to people in the auto ancillary. Is there a clarity of government policies, long-range policies? There are a concept of we should not import from China, we should have the self-sufficient, we have a poor substitution, uh, we should manufacture in India. Do we think from your perspective, and you want a frank view, what is something which is required? Because, you know, we are talking of a phenomenal growth. And, you know, if you take it as a cricket match, we are going to have to score fours in every over, if not a six. We can't reach that goal by scoring singles and waiting for nudges like what Cheteshwar Pujara does. I mean, I mean, nothing wrong in the way he does, but we need to act somewhat like Mr. Pant is there, but uh, more in this, with also being safe and secure. So from your perspective, what's happening behind the scene? We hear of PLI, we hear of crude substitution, we hear of make in India, we hear of not dependent on China, and when we hear of technology upgradation skill development, I hear so many things. So from your perspective, what's required to be done? First, first of all, uh, when, we, when we analyze the total cost of ownership of the vehicle, that is the vehicle cost plus the running cost, it's very, very clear that three-wheeler makes a lot of sense to go switch from ICE to uh, electric. Two-wheeler with the subsidy, it makes a lot of sense. Now with the fame revised subsidy, even it is, you know, if, if you compare the ICE versus uh, EV, is almost 27% uh, drop in uh, the total cost of ownership. So, on an overall, uh, this, uh, if you see the cost on a life cycle of five years, definitely EV is uh, clearly the winner against ICE. But what is the deterrent factor? See, this, the, the, the deterrent factor is the initial cost of purchase. So, for, for, a, uh, for a guy to go and buy a vehicle, he, he will always evaluate between ICE and uh, EV. So EV is much expensive in the initial cost, but the running cost is much cheaper. But he doesn't see that in the long run perspective. So now we should focus on how we can reduce the initial cost. So initial cost, again, the three factors. One is the battery cost, then the electric powertrain, 
and the power electronics. So all these things, uh, you know, we are still dependent on a lot of imports. Now, we have to, um, you know, from the government as well as the, the industry, we need to focus on how we can increase the localization. Overall, we need to uh, create an ecosystem where the local manufacturing will be increased. And uh, there is, you know, in the starting phase, I would say that in the starting phase, we need to have lower in uh, imports duty so that, you know, uh, even the, um, the auto component manufacturers, they will be doing the investment in phase five. They cannot localize everything one shot. So you need to have this imports duty, uh, you know, uh, increase in a phase manner. So initially you should have a lower impure, import duty and then slowly increase it over a period of time, some fixed time frame. So that there should be a long range, you know, um, uh, guideline uh, from the government on this. So that there could be an adequate planning from, uh, from the industry. Uh, having said that, already we have a lot of this uh, incentive and subsidy already laid out by the central government and also as mentioned by Mr. Sinha, uh, many state governments have uh, brought in the EV policies. So these are all uh, giving a lot of optimis optimism. And I think we are, we are uh, in a tipping point of a massive transformation to electrification. Now the whole, the whole thing is the, how do we work out the cost of battery? How do we reduce the import content on electric powertrain? And coming to the electronics part, you can see that um, we are importing a lot of the parts uh, even though the uh, the tire one and tire two manufacturers are uh, trying to local localize some of them, but the core electronics is still, uh, you know, we, we have to import a lot of these parts. Now, for this core uh, electronics, like the wafers or the PCBs, how do we, uh, as a government and private partnership, because this needs a large scale in the investment. So we need not depend on China. We need not depend on uh, Southeast Asian countries or uh, Europe, we, we need not depend on. So we need to create a self-sufficiency in India by this private and public partnership. So these will help us in driving the cost down. And, and finally, the end customer will be able to uh, afford. Basically, it comes to the affordability of the vehicle uh, as an initial cost. So, you know, a very pertinent points mentioned by Mr. Jay Kumar. I mean, the one thing which he mentioned is that the policy has to be long-term vision. It can't be fits and starts. Because, and he says, we need to be visionary. We need to be ambitious, but we also need to be pragmatic. You can't digitize overnight. And as he's mentioned, if you look at the entire ecosystem of electric vehicles, especially two-wheelers, there is a battery, there's electric powertrain, there's electronics, battery. We don't have the lithium, the electronic powertrains. We still are, there are many elements to it. And the electronics is still whatever it may be, is important. So there has to be a very focused plan in terms of giving incentive, partnership between the government and the industry and having phase program. There's no point cutting off the tap, as you mentioned, is even if the import duties are low, they can start being starting from low and they can go higher. But if you say that, okay, we'll stop total imports, it doesn't work that way. So what I understand from you, you're looking at a very focused, clear plan, which may be a long-term plan, but which is broken down into small, small steps and which is you need to do and check. That's only it will happen. Otherwise, the customer demand may be there, incentives may be there, but if the industry is not ready and the price doesn't come out right or the product doesn't come out right, you will always be a challenge. You will always be catching up situation. That's what I understand from you. Yeah. Now, coming uh, that, to you. Yeah. 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 Anything? Yeah. The, the, yeah. the other point, the, the, the one, uh, and we need to also think uh, about swappable battery system. So swappable okay. or leasing battery. You know, you should remove the battery out of the cost of the vehicle. So the initial price will be much lower because almost battery is uh, more than 40% of the vehicle cost. So you can, you know, it will be quickly equal to the uh, ICE engine. So this, this, will, this also should be one of the ideas uh, uh, thought by the government as well as the industry OEMs. So, you know, one good, very good point on swappable. I think Mr. Gil touched upon a very interesting or a very pertinent point on thermal, thermal engineering, because the unpredictability of our 
vehicles, EVs is causing a challenge. You know, when you're having a new thing, you need a high level of predictability. And you talked of, you know, think global, but act local. Is the industry looking at somehow getting, building a higher level of predictability and understanding the need or the requirement of thermal engineering for the Indian context where temperatures can be very extreme? And this is questions to you, uh, Jack I mean, just want to, since this was a topic Mr. Gill raised, I want to get your perspective on this. Yeah, I think uh, thermal management is important. I, and, and, and as uh, Mr. Gill also mentioned, ultimately, it, it, uh, it is the uh, quality and reliability of the vehicle. So uh, when, a, when a guy is going with the vehicle, it should be as easy to operate as an ice, ice uh, scooter or a bike. So ho holistically, the, the vehicle should have uh, easy maintenance and uh, zero maintenance kind of a, a, a um, product. So that, that will also help. And also a lot of skepticism about the past, as Mr. Gill also mentioned, that that has to be, you know, yeah, one success will lead to other success. You know, so once we have good products coming into the market, and I think now we are having more better products that are coming. If, if you see in the past, we had a lot of these low speed uh, vehicles and uh, cheap Chinese motors in the market. Now we are having better powertrains uh, in the market. So these are all these things will give more confidence for the end user. And this will spread by uh, the word of the mouth. And then you can, you can see the uh, sales picking up. So Karthik, uh, you have the unique advantage. You've been part of this EV ecosystem at a very ground granular level in India. And now you're, I won't say you're far away, but you've got a very good uh, a ringside view of what's happening in India and what's happening in other markets. So what are global practices in terms of, whether it's in terms of policy, whether in terms of technology, whether in terms of development, whether in terms of customer education, which you think are required for India for the different stakeholders? Thank you. So I think, uh... First of all, I would say that the policy in India has been evolving and, and it has sort of taken into account the learnings from the previous, um, the, the frame one and from there, the, the feedback from different stakeholders. So I, I do see that not everything is obviously possible to be incorporated, but having said that, I think that has been a very clear listening that from the stakeholders that has gone into evolving our own policy. So I would say that overall, there is a, a, a good, state that we are at. Having said that, I think where today, for example, if if I may uh, point out one or two things is, first of all, Mr. Gill also mentioned, I think, how do we address charging infrastructure? I think this is today, uh, I think from a, from a four-wheeler perspective, all the high power chargers and there are global standards available. So, there is a lot of maturity that is there, both from a technical standards perspective as well as uh, benchmarks on policy that can be used to evolve a uh, four-wheeler and other higher power vehicle uh, policies, which some of which is incorporated in our frame policy today. But where I think we clearly see uh, 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 an indigenization of policy required is how do we address the the forms the for, the small form factor vehicles like two wheelers and three wheelers and the charging needs of those vehicles? What is the appropriate uh, mechanism for that? And clearly, again, uh, to, to the government's credit, I do hear the, uh, that there is a Bharat low-cost AC standard that has been developed and it's a, probably in the works. It's going to be released at some point in time. Uh, we would love to see what, what, uh, what that uh, comes up with. But I think, that, so I think that's the right direction, that how do you make charging simple, low-cost, accessible, doesn't add additional cost on the vehicle side also because today the high power charger connectors are expensive. So they do add cost to the vehicle and we don't want to do that for a competitively priced two wheeler. So I think clearly charging, uh, solving the charging problem for a country like ours. And I would add to that one other perspective with the charging, the problem of charging needs to also take into account the problem of parking. That organized parking in this country is not a, a, not a commonplace occurrence, let's put it that way. So, so I think the, the involvement of municipalities and city officials and how do we kind of collectively think through this whole problem? Because without dedicated real estate to set up charging stations or some locations, you cannot do that. So I think that's a allied problem that kind of needs to be looked into. 
Um, I think the other, uh, some of the other perspectives have not said that India is lacking or any, any different, but clearly how do we finance electric vehicles? How do we build uh, asset holding companies that can possibly hold these assets and build leasing programs around it? Some of those are questions that are being globally tackled today. And that's, I think, very pertinent to the Indian context as well. Here, I think some of the nuances that one could look at, for example, is there are, um, and I'm, I'm not kind of trying to nitpick here, but just to sort of um, lay it out, and I'm sure the government is aware of this, is, for example, the tax that's applicable when you lease a vehicle. First of all, uh, what's the rate of taxation? Is it because the vehicle is taxed at 5% USD, but the lease tax today is probably 18%. So I think that adds some kind of a discrepancy in the whole. I think these are some of the, I would say more at a tactical operational details that need to be kind of ironed out to make this whole ecosystem far more uh, well lubricated to, to put it that way. Thank you. I think you mentioned think global would act local. That's what I take from you. Very nice. You know, very and nice. one thing which you said is very clearly is the charging infrastructure. One side we always employee said, oh, you can charge it anywhere, your home socket, you can charge it. But how many customers have access to where they have dedicated parking or a charging where they can charge their vehicle at the evening or night? Or then there's a solution, which is the expensive solution, fast charging. So we are between the devil and the deep sea. <coughs> so you're saying, can we evolve some, and we'll be picking up Mr. Gill's brain on this when we come to him. Can we evolve something, a Bharat norm, for a quick, reliable, reassuring charging, which is there? Because this <laughs> range and reach anxiety, the two hours, is very high in customers' mind. Yes. It is very high. You may say, and the action will only come, the proof of the pudding will be and when he sees it delivered. It can't be just by preaching. So that's one thing which is imagined. And then what you mentioned is this uh, whole concept of how you take up parking, municipalities, other things. So it's not just a central policy and not even a state policy. Because individually in our country, we have RTOs. We have local yes. policies, local municipal corporations. So you say this, the action has to be fought on in terms of, even in terms of a thing like a charging or a range or reach, not only at national, state, local, municipality level. That's what I hear from you. Absolutely. So that's very, very, so that's a lot of work to be done and you need to have a very dedicated game plan for it. Uh, coming to Arvind, uh, you know, you said, and you said very rightly, you know, the one of the biggest challenges is the initial price of a EV two-wheeler still is higher, although... And then financing is a challenge, which I think we will be discussing with Mr. Sena and Mr. Kelly. But, but now, since you, when you go to various cities, and I mean, you're, when you're launching your, uh, any commercial two-wheeler application, see, one is it's done beyond the ambit of the government policy. So a lot of unstructured thing is happening, which is, uh, you know, and sometimes when unstructured activity happens, it gives a wrong practices set in, it gives a bad name to the movement. It happened to the lead acid batteries, <coughs> which were used, a lot in Delhi, which is there. So we need to structure it, we need to organize it, but we need also need to show that it become, doesn't become so complex that it's difficult to fathom. As uh, uh, it was mentioned, Mr. Gopal was mentioning, you know, the leasing thing is 18%. Now from your perspective, and you're talking from your company industry, that we see a last scope of generating employment and even last mile connectivity, whether it's in, uh, in terms of people vehicle movement, people movement, or maybe in load movement. So what are the four, five, if you have to mirror around the four, five key steps and which they should test, test should be said, you can check it out. Like you should check out blue, it was red, it was blue in school and college when you used to do a chemistry test. What are the five, six key things? So number one, number two, number three, number four. If you have to view commercial application, what we need to do? Yeah. So I think, we want to hear a voice from the ground now. Yeah, definitely. I think some will be repetitive, but I think it is like, I believe if you just give a discount, but the product is not good, I don't think no one will use the product in an, in an, in an, in our product world, right? In a similar way, even though there are enough subsidies and even though you're reducing the price, but the product itself is not favorable. Uh, for example, let me put in our use case where uh, there will be two people all, always on the bike uh, and you're talking about maybe 150 to 200 kgs of, uh, on, a, on a vehicle and it still needs to give me 70, 80 kilometers um, in an ideal world, because ultimately my captain travels 100 to 120 kilometers every day, right? So to cover this, I mean, if, if I check the products existing, if I look at the available options, I still believe we don't have a great product for the use case of a commercial, uh, especially for a taxi use case. 
and even the last mile uh, and first mile i think there are definitely few uh, there can be some compromises there because the it is only one person and then the experience of a user is not very high so first thing is more about product um, and second thing uh, majority of our vehicles uh, are also financed um, which uh, you which is already been touched base that because of lack of finance options and lack of second hand as a market a lot of people feel that even though if i buy it what will happen after 2 3 years down the line and uh, the other thing mr gill has mentioned that is anyone giving guarantee that it will work because i haven't no one has seen a vehicle traveling 50000 kilometers or a lakh kilometers till now so how can i be assured that it will travel or can anyone give me that kind of insurance or assurity that it will travel 50000 otherwise i will replace uh, 100% of the battery or the product so i think uh, the and that is number 2 and the third major thing that i believe is uh, especially in our use case of our captain so what we are saying is you give away your vehicle and buy a new vehicle altogether so if you want to see a huge shift that is happening say 30% of the vehicles coming into electric uh, a year down or 5 years down the line that means literally what should happen is every year like we should have 50 to 60% of new vehicles should come only from electric because the base of existing vehicles are so high so how can you make people give away their vehicle and then move into electric and that's where the pace at which the overall market for commercial use case will grow if i just rely on new guys coming in buying new vehicles and then coming into commercial use case it will always be very slow adoption um, so can there be a way where we can use or can uh, incentivize people who are completely giving away their vehicle but then converting into electric so i i think those are some that's the reason we were even though we are convincing our captains and our drivers to move away from your electric uh, uh, ic vehicle to electric then they like i have already bought the vehicle 2 years back 3 years back what will happen for that vehicle uh, so someone either i have to sell it at the best cost or i have to make this vehicle also run maybe like an electric uh, the benefit that it is having so i think that those are some challenges uh, which we see to make it a reality uh, and i think it is not it has to be a focused approach of maybe a city wide so that is even when we are doing this electric adoption and even though we have set our own targets we are doing very city specific because the problems are very different at a city level and building even charging infra or partnering with the local players also becomes a, a super critical so we are taking a very city oriented approach uh, and going city after city and then learning of it and then making it a norm throughout the country so you know two things which have come out and we need to discuss in detail one is the financing part of new vehicles new yeah. evs i was talking to somebody he said sir the price of a ev two wheeler is about 40% higher and then he said sir the down for the same profile of customer i get 60% 80% of financing for a normal ic engine this is nationally i'm saying i'm not talking about goa or something but in a ev i get for 60% so effectively my down payment for a first time buyer is about three times higher i mean he showed the calculation which was i mean it jolted me that you know this is something a challenge and unless we solve this you know the, this elephant in the the room that is as a problem which is continuing the second issue which he talked of you know we hear words like scrappage uh, incentivize uh, exchanging vehicle from old to new or sometimes you also hear the way thing called retrofitment now when we look at this entire piece and uh, we'll come to you mr gill and uh, 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 mr sena so mr sena from the financing part of you because that's the pain area and you know the people the companies which drive financing in in auto industry are basically starts from the public sector banks and what public sector bank does the private sector banks also follow so what is is that issue being also seen but it's never in the policy level but is the financing issue being seen yes it is it is being seen we are working on it that how the assurance to the banks could be given and what uh, additional financial into innovations could be or instruments could be put in place so that the credit uh, risk that could be hedged so we are working yes so there is a, some work going on so so we should uh, expect some some path breaking policy or announcement in the very near future i mean definitely some positive developments so something positive developments which is that is we are aware of the, the point that the cost of finance is high especially for the 
two wheelers and three wheelers that we are aware and that is what we have taken uh, it on ourselves that how to solve it out yes that is and the concept which uh, arvin mentioned of incentivizing people to shift who already own a vehicle from shifting from a normal ic vehicle so this with the incentive is there some thought on that part that is already embedded in many of the state ev policies that is but, already there but is the policy and this is a question i like to ask arvin the i want you frank view is it in policy papers or do you seeing that action happening on the ground of this because it's part of policies of various states so the answer can be only in yes or no it can't be in the middle yeah uh, yeah definitely see i think the challenge is the amount of incentive for people who bought the vehicle or who are still paying the emi and then you asking them to convert uh, yeah it is not in that much favorable for people who have well, like paid a lot of emi and then no no so people in the emi pays would have paid the emi in 3 4 years i'm talking of people who have already have the vehicle for more than 4 years because the yeah. old to the uh, i mean population of the ground level is very high yeah so now it's more about see if you are selling a second hand vehicle uh, which you are selling for 25 to 30000 versus you are scraping it and getting whatever is into a 5000 or 10000 how well that can be paid off i think that's the challenge uh, yes uh, it's more about awareness also i'm pretty sure a lot of this our captain is don't even aware to how can they even look into this policy and then get into benefits of that and someone like us or aggregators or someone the players like us has to play a role to make it happen but uh, i would definitely say that it's not coming into reality that people are actually doing it and saying that i want to buy a new vehicle it's also a combination of the product that is available not completely with this so what i hear from uh, mr sanka gave a very diplomatic first part but he says we need to make it into reality so you know from the vision to the reality or as they say in hindi movie sapno ko saakar karna hai coming to mr gill uh, you know this financing is a big piece because if you don't uh, uh, track the financing so what do you think are the suggestions what the government could do or the banks could do on financing front because this is something unless we resolve this this can become the biggest bottleneck for the growth arun uh, yeah financing surely is but uh, i take it a little broad well uh, at a broad level see i can't expect government to keep funding the subsidy forever right so okay. there is a short window here two year three years at max and then we will will be like a begging bowl right so in this window if we don't do other things in place and enough demand and one of them is financing the day this tap is dry we will go back to what norway did and other countries did like there was a slump again so that's why there is a short window to do many many things to be able to self sustain not on the crutches but on its own merits from that point of view yes financing is one sure thing but a private financer for example we have in smeb memberships now around 13 14 financers who are doing it but for them it's not a business case it's a pilot plot it's a proof of concept because why should they dedicate the resource for something where return is less where risk is very high so on a private financing side it will happen its natural curve but yeah the cooperative banks and public sector banks they they even if they are pushed they have their own set of bureaucracy and lethargy lethargy and that manager doing it somebody not doing it so it's a very difficult so in financing i believe it has to be something like pradhan mantri yojana or something which comes out and gets drummed about and gives an opportunity for two years under a very special regime it has to be pushed and then the public sector and the private sector join hand and do it but more than that if we have to reach that 1 million or 2 million in 3 years or 4 years before the subsidy dries out what are the other thing one is not not let the subsidy dry out which means we have to continuously generate resources to be able to subsidize till the time inflection point reaches to that level we have 10 million 5 million or so which means we have to introduce polluters pay principle here generate some resource to be able to fund the, the electric mobility revolution which is so so much required which also means mandating to certain extent because now everybody is saying there are better quality vehicles but there is some certain resistance in buying especially on the b2b sector so in b2b certainly i think mandating is the way forward in the next one year in some sort of a nudge pressure that here everything is there now the financing is also available please cross over to electric okay. 20% year on year and so many other things so i would say a list of 10 things to be done in next 3 years not spread over 5 years 7 years which will make it happen 
if we do it like a previous years slowly bit by bit it all gets dispersed and it doesn't make that impact everybody has to sit together again and i believe niti aayog is one agency which has changed so much for better and i i i i have a dream that a desire that this set of people remain there for 2 to 3 years to see to it that the industry is taken to a very different level and there is a constant type of a coordination feedback and correction through the ages of niti aayog will do wonders so mr sena a lot of responsibility on your shoulder and that's mr gilly saying that you know and they have a lot of faith in you uh, you know one we thing which you uh, live up to it you live up to it so they will live up to it so that's a very positive thing so mr gilly you said it directly and mr sena has already given we live up to it or he might even exceed expectations uh, the one point which i think uh, very pertinent you mentioned that finance cannot be looked in isolation it is one of the steps and it has to do with a number of steps together so you just can't have a pull or push strategy you need to have a pull strategy and what point which mr gill mentioned is don't phase it out so much that you know generally it's happening today when we are not a subject been like in exams we said we'll study it day after tomorrow so tomorrow never comes there's a famous novel by harold so you know how do we see that the one things you want to do we do it in the next one or two years because then we'll perfect it act on it and then we'll reap the benefits of it so number of steps together do it together in a shorter time do it cohesively and the re- and uh, and the you can say the zubin mehta has been already been declared it's the niti ayog i mean that's mr gill also mentioned they have to play the the big brothers or the father role in this or the mother's role in this part of it so that's how you move ahead on that part of it uh coming to you jay uh, anything which is required at a very short term level you said this is something these two things we need to do in the next one year if we don't do them we'll miss the bus the one thing i would <clears throat> like obviously as a, as a component manufacturer uh, you know we need to invest a lot in r&d and technology so we mm-hmm. have to keep improving the performance of the parts and to both in terms i mean performance of the uh, the the uh, powertrain and uh, driving down the cost everything is has to be done so uh, you know uh, both the, like mncs uh, should be encouraged to invest on uh, r&d uh, okay. in india and as specifically you know this uh, so some of the mncs do not have two wheeler in their portfolio but then we can adapt the products in for two wheelers uh, and uh, this this is one one very important thing which uh, i would say and secondly we should create the as we already mentioned the ecosystem for manufacturing so ultimately uh, as uh, mr gill also said the subsidies cannot be forever so we need to actually drive the cost down so what will make the vehicle affordable equal to ice or lesser than that and better performance than ice so this is um, something you know we should evolve over a period of time so for this manufacturing cost should be uh, uh, should be low so the entire ecosystem whether it is electronics whether it is the uh, the battery every, the these ecosystem should be you know, on a large scale which will also drive the cost so you know what we can say is uh, the giga scale so and and two wheeler already is uh, you know uh, india is the largest uh, two wheeler manufacturer 20 21 million or 24 million vehicles a uh, huge scope and uh, th- this will definitely uh, make the cost down and then automatically as the performance of the product is getting better and better more buyers will come and i think there will be a complete transformation towards electric very very quickly so you know uh, very rightly mentioned you know this focus on because unfortunately we are the biggest market in two wheelers another market is china so a lot of things have to be done by us we can't look towards the west what we could look in four wheelers and how do you focus on r&d and as uh, should again again infrastructure that's going to be the key so that's going to be the reassuring and the reliability factor uh, kartik uh, anything from your, your point you'd like to add on this uh, on the on the aspect of what on, on the aspect of financing or the aspect of anything else which is required it for the next two years um couple of things um, uh, i'm i'm just wanting to point out a couple of things that's already happened which um, susina would probably have mentioned anyway 
I think this recent announcement about ESL subsidiary convergence energy becoming um, an aggregator for two wheelers, three wheelers, and buses is a fantastic step. I think that's another wonderful um, step that has been uh, announced from the government's perspective. Because ultimately, what that does is, I think it creates aggregates demand, which helps to build scale in the on the supply side. Second, it delinks or, or sort of remove some of the technology risk factors from the end operator or the end users uh, books. So therefore all the technology risks then sit on the asset owning companies aspects. And given the quality or the, or the, the, the credit worthiness of, of the asset holding company, they are able to get financing at better rates as well, which then they can pass on to, uh, to the end user. So I think there is a win-win that is uh, um, created through these kinds of asset holding company structures, which is, uh, I think, very commend, which is a very commendable step and probably a first of its kind I'm seeing um, coming from a government entity uh, anywhere in the world. Good. I certainly uh, commend uh, that step. So I think that's a fantastic uh, predecessor and hopefully a precursor to the public private sector also stepping in into that space. Um, I think that is also, I would like to add that with the point that you mentioned, Mr. Malhotra, about why is there this 40% um, and that there is this three x increase in the, so ultimately it's, it's the big perception about this, about the risk perception from the financier's point of view. And that risk perception includes the technology risk, which has been spoken about, the resale value and the residual value or resale markets availability risk. There is also the risk, especially in the commercial use case, and I think Arvind might... Um, uh, agree with this that the the driver come owners they come from economically weak sections, so their own intrinsic credit worthiness is not very strong, which again enhances the risk perception in the minds of the financier. Uh, and lastly, of course, you have um, the unknown um, the, the recent value which I spoke about. Sorry. So, so I think putting all of this together, so there is what we are looking at doing as part of uh, different initiatives inside the country is also to look at. How do we disaggregate these risks and take them to be owned by different entities? For example, huh, the, one of the important things is like from a commercial use case perspective, can they give a contract to their driver owner which matches the financing term? So if the term of financing, the loan is let's say three years, but the driver is driver owner is on a yearly contract with the, I'm not saying about Rapido, I'm saying in, in general, uh, then there is a mismatch in terms of the bank's perception that, hey, how can I give a loan for three years when his contract with the company is only for one year? So I think these are, so there is a little bit that each stakeholder needs to kind of chew upon a little bit and take it on themselves. So and so when we bring all of them together, I think that is, then that residual risk can be written off through financing mechanisms like first loss guarantees and other kinds of financial instruments which can then create an ecosystem that makes this much more, that that 3x starts to come down. So that's the only other point. So, you know, Karthik mentioned very thing. You talked of aggregating demand and you can say de-aggregating de de risk or sharing risk. <laughs> so, very so you need to aggregate demand, which is happening. There's a policy clearly. And how do we convert it? So the focus is on more on three wheelers and two wheelers. And how do we disaggregate risk? Because all these issues of you know, which you mentioned that the contract is of a shorter period, the profile of the customer is different. So there are a lot of these things which have to be happened. I mean, it's a great employment generation also. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of question points which have been mentioned, you know, before, I mean, uh, Arvind, a lot of things, they are spoken on your behalf. If they, yeah. these things happen of aggregating demand and aggregating risk, uh, the job of commercial application to wheeler happens. Anything you'd like to add on that? Yeah, I think uh, definitely uh, there are a couple of new startups which have come in and which whom we are also working on, on how do you finance to these, mm. uh, uh, our driver partners. I think the concept is also very similar to what Karthik has mentioned that instead of just looking at me, look at the alternatives that he has, if he say Rapido, maybe he goes to other aggregators, he goes to food ordering platforms, he goes to maybe some other commercial use case. And if all these players come together and say that, Together, we will give you our date, our information of his earnings and we will deduct uh, from our earnings to, so that he pays the EMI on a regular basis. If that happens, I think that's where the, slowly the risk uh, from a financial point of view will go down drastically. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. Please continue. 
Yeah, and this has to be a maybe a combined effort, especially because um, as Mr. Gill also has mentioned that we can't expect everything from the government will have to do and then forever, right? So there has to be a role, an entire ecosystem has to play, and there are a lot of fuel companies who are coming into charging uh, stations so that the the point of where will you have these probable stations, etc., will also get solved. So I think it has to be an ecosystem coming together and solving it, then expecting uh, everything will be done and then we'll go and. Uh, just uh, utilize the timing, right? So I think that I definitely see that that few of these ideas on financing can actually take it uh, to uh, an aggregator playing a role there. Uh, and because everyone is aligned, because it reduces the cost for sure. So now it is really an incentive for aggregators to work together uh, to make this shift happen. So as mentioned, uh, aggregation will fuel demand and also reduce cost. And yeah. it will send the volume, it will get into a virtuous cycle. And you said when the risk also, the support system is there, it's kind of a positive spiral, then those risks also reduce and you disaggregate risk. As they say, Tum aage badho, hum tumhare saath hai. that if I ever put it in Hindi slogan. Uh, we'll come to three, four questions, very interesting questions, and then we'll sum up. So there are questions uh, which I'm seeing. Now there's a question, I mean, I don't know, Mr. Gill or Mr. Uh, uh, can answer this. One gentleman says that we are still at the learning phase. Why we are so strict on importing of two wheelers electric? Can we be slightly liberal in the first year where we import electric two wheelers even if required, uh, fully built? And then uh, after time, when the ecosystem build up, I mean, we can uh, get out of it. So, is it too yeah. radical? <laughs> so, this is, a, this is a question often asked by members to me also. So, the answer to this is we should, we should emphasize quality uh -huh. first. Mm -hmm. Then localization or import. Today, the oh. quality standards in certifications are oh. very loose. Mm -hmm. The most important part is whether it comes from Taiwan, China or France, the quality has to be par excellence. And that has to go through that ARI, CMVR and other routes. So if that is done, then imports can also work well for some time. But unfortunately, imports are today synonym with poor quality because of China. So I am okay. for that same opinion that uh, you shouldn't put so many things on a new plant which has just been nurtured, start pruning it, let it grow, but make sure that the basic quality standards are met. So that's the answer to all the members. Start making good quality, you won't face the problem from imports. Then. So what I'm hearing is putting in good quality, even if you import good quality, government can look at it. And Mr. Yeah. Sena, your view on this? It's very correct. Quality has to be there. And there was an issue of, we were discussing about R&D. So if I might say that it is time that industries, they also get themselves connected to the IITs with a specific problem statement, time bound delivery, sponsor that program, and within a six months or one year kind of thing, that is the max to max, get the problem solved. It may, it may be concerned with uh, say power train, but it could be other things also. So, because let me tell you, let me inform you all, that our IITs are doing brilliantly. They are doing exceptionally brilliant work in electric mobility. At least I can vouch for seven of them. Brilliant work is going on. Just is that the, you get yourself connected to them, give them a specific problem statement. Don't sponsor a department that is of no use. Give a specific problem statement and then see the results. They are there. If need be, we are here to connect you to the one that you want to. So that is the kind of thing because we are nudging IITs also. As we discussed that everything of the supply chain, all the eight thrust areas, they have to be got into, they have to be placed into the groove. Only then this entire ecosystem, this mobility can be from. So, you know, very interesting point you raised is that uh, we have not leveraged the entire concept of this industry academy interface. It's very strong. It, there is a lot of potential which can be done across. And, and what you said is very correct. You know, just two days back, uh, I was in IIT Mandi, Himachal Pradesh, where I am presently speaking also from. And I found the work they are doing on electric three-wheelers and the way they are talking of how in mountainous region they can do. It was a revelation for me. I thought probably it will be done in IIT Chennai in Delhi. Even IIT Mandi, it is happening. So I'm just saying uh, industry should leverage that benefit out of it, which is there. The second question is on this battery. A lot of people say some battery is like a, uh, is like a, you can say a, a area which will pull you down whatever you do because there is lithium 
and there's a lot of talk happening on having different materials different technologies of battery i mean there were some reports on aluminium batteries some reports on other areas so is there something and this is a question uh, i'll come to mr jay kumar and then to mr gill is there some happening are we going to only be depend on lithium which is a china prerogative and they got all the mines or are we can the india we can break through in a different technologies of battery which has more power pack more denser uh, more cost effective is there something happening there that's the question somebody is asking ki battery what's happening on batteries in india i think uh, what what uh, what is happening on the batteries is the lithium ion batteries so uh, i mean uh, we, we, the, that is the uh, current uh, uh, technology which uh, every oem is working on i don't know if uh, mr gill can uh, further add on on, uh, on his perspective no it's it's very clear that the world is going in one direction on a short term and a mid term and a long term and there is no substitute to lithium in the short term to even some mid term so let's not you know have a dream of substituting in india something from a grounds up where even the r and d has not even set it it is it takes 5 to 7 years for anything like a sodium air to become commercially available so what you have in the near future till the time you reach your targets is lithium all you have to do is handle it carefully have long term contracts reduce the content of lithium have batteries are more reliable let's not try and reinvent the wheel and do it separately from like dsc is doing it others are doing it but that's not the answer to the future uh, near future that we have what we want so very pertinent i think so question and answer mr gill is that lithium there is no answer in the next 3 4 years they definitely we should be looking around in the world and even in developing india something is emerging it might emerge but let's not say let's wait for something else i mean we have to do lithium only more long term contracts more away more battery management system so that's a question which is asked on battery the now i have only time for another question before we do the summing up people there somebody said sir there so many announcements so many startups coming every day there's announcement and a startup coming i mean they say we get worried what is their pedigree what is their quality what is their objective so it's it's too easy it's like you're making maggi noodles every day i mean making electric vehicle is not a, a joke it's it's a much over high technology so saying too much of announcements is also a challenge how do you separate the wheat from the chaff and this is a question to mr uh, clearly first to uh, mr gill and then to because you represent the association of electric vehicles so every day you read a paper this company that company this company looks like a, the happy days are again we'll have electric vehicles we manufacture we look in corner and then From a policy level, from uh, Mr. Sena, so Mr. Kelly, too uh, much of too much. Yes. It says too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> See, to guys like we mentor from SMEV, and so many of them, like you are saying, they come up that I have created this vehicle, I have created a business, I want your support. I say you have entered the fire, because just a nut bolt technology of getting four things together, putting a scooter on the road, is one tenth of the job. if you are serious you have to run an automotive business then this is not what you should be doing so my sort of direction to all these people is don't think that if ether can do it you can also do it those were different times so concentrate on behind the vehicle around the vehicle rather on a complete product i would believe that startups can do much better job if they fragment the vehicle into many many pieces and where they specialize in lies whether in connectivity or in a bms or of charging solutions and so many other factors are there i i fail to believe that like in ic engine there will be five players in electric also i think there will be maximum seven eight players in four to five years and all the guys who are trying to you know uh, work with fire they'll burn out on this so you know uh... Mr. Sir, you mentioned in the early part of the discussions. Everybody coming to you. How do you see one? There are certain people who are fly by night operators. Some people are very passionate, but they don't know what they are getting into. As uh, as Mr. Gill mentioned, you know, it's baptism by fire. It's much more complex than you know. They say number of moving parts in electric vehicle. That's why I have to just assemble any shed. So how does the government policy see that people come to the right place, the right part of the ecosystem, and the fly by night operators don't fill and give them move with a bad name? no uh, from our perspective we simply encourage them we don't dissuade okay. of course we are well aware of the fact that technology is one thing and converting that technology into a viable business proposition it is something else but if somebody wants to have a le- some learning somebody wants to go ahead go ahead on the uh, on this particular trajectory 
we are right here to help them. There's no problem. We let them know that what exactly, who knows, one of them may be tomorrow, they, one of them, I mean, the new ones may be, they turn out to be the best. So there's, we are here to kind of uh, give them as much information as possible, help them out. And that is all. Then the decision is to be taken by them. Yeah, so you're saying, uh, really, you're there to encourage them, but they all the objective is to guide them. Then they should come to the right place, which is there. So I think we have time for these questions. We'll come to the last summing up round. So it's been a very incisive, and I must thank the panelists for very putting their points very comprehensively. And suppose we can combine all that. As somebody mentioned, it has to be clearly in sort of coordination that how do we put all the steps in place together. But I'll before I end the session, I want to go to each one of you and I want to have a poll. We said that by 2030, it has to be a way of life, a two-wheelers, electric two-wheelers. So let's assume, and this is a question, I only need numbers. Let's assume the market for electric two-wheelers is 30 million in 2030. Or there could be higher even, I'm not saying. How much percentage you think the way things are moving would be electric vehicles? So starting from you, Mr. Gill, give a percentage figure. <laughs> I'll convert the percentage to numbers. See, the way we are going, it will be 10% or less. Mm. But if you do four things in the next six months, it could become 15 to 20%. And what those four things are simply like Swachh Bharat campaign, start the Swachh Vayu campaign in Food Electric and a whole hog drum it. Have at least 300, 400,000 charging points to states across the states. In the next three months, let us train 100,000 mechanics. It easily can be done in two shots of advanced training. And such like things, which are extreme short measures, will be on a very different trajectory. Okay. If you so, don't do it, it will be 10%. So you're saying the way we are progress, the way we, if we continue in our old way, the Hindu rate of growth, as you say, will be 10%. Mm -hmm. But some simple steps of having a policy, having a training, having a simple infrastructure in six months, it can move to 20%. Coming to Mr. Sena, because you were a very you have a very unenviable task. You were the hat, you are now from the government side even, what do you think it will happen? No, you can no. give your normal thing and you think if you do things right, it can be, a, as Mr. Gill has mentioned, two figures. He said, normal course, this is the thing, but if you do get act right, the percentage is this. No, I'll recuse from giving a specific percentage. <laughs> I, can only say that. I can only say, because, you know, the simple thing is that in a setup like India, if you are expecting that a mandate, it doesn't. Technology does, awareness does, persuasion does, marketing initiatives do. That is precisely how you see the growth journey of mobile that has been like that. But in case of automobile, if you are supporting a particular uh, segment or particular technology style, that cannot be a way. But yes, it will be very, very aspirational. Could be somewhere close to what Mr. Gill has said, maybe a little more than that also. Okay. So I'm hearing from you that, as uh, Mr. Sena mentioned, you can't mandate. You need to guide, you need to motivate, you need to judge, you need to mentor. And he says, if it is done, and these are not very difficult, it will be higher than Mr. Gill's figure. Mr. Gill is talking about 20%, could be even 30%. I'm not putting words in your mouth. That's what I'm assuming <laughs> from part of it. Uh, coming to Mr. Jayakumar, you put a figure across from your perspective. Because you understand the entire thing, ecosystem behind the batteries, the starters, the motors, the management system. I don't know if it's a crystal ball gazing kind of a you situation. Have to crystal ball gazing. Because <laughs> some, some, um, uh, some agencies or some, you can say, the top consultancy are doing some crystal ball gazing. So yeah, yeah. you are in a better position to do crystal gazing than some of yeah, them we, who are armchair critics. Yeah, we had an internal study and uh, what we saw is about 28% uh, shift towards electric uh, by 2030. But then I think that is uh, maybe a conservative estimate. Oh, I I, I think it'll be much more. I mean, if you see the uh, uh, the fame two revised, uh, I think that is not uh, taken into the calculation. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, clearly CO two emission reduction with this electrification is going to this is going to be a very significant factor, and uh, the government regulation to this to reduce pollution will be one of the driving factors. And at the same time, driving the cost down at the same so, time, improving so the quality. You, so that, so that what, will... what I hear from you, 28% is what was done, but you consider it conservative. 
if we do some things on reducing pollution and the focus which niti ayog has started on government policies it can be much higher so we are raising the bar mr gill started 10 in 20 uh, mr sena mentioned 20% plus plus he didn't need the number but he was he says it will be more aspirational and uh, mr jay kumar sorry i mentioned 28 was normal but we can do much better now coming to you kartik from your point of view and we'll note these numbers if we have a panel discussion 5 years later we'll say this was what was said by each person and where we are yeah so vice man once said that when you make a prediction either give a number or a time but don't put both together <laughs> <laughs> so i think uh, i'm 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 ignoring his his wise words but um uh, to be honest i think i i'm taking a macro view of things the way the global sentiment to move away from fossil fuels is building yeah, up right. uh, building up momentum is tremendous the way financing is coming towards driving those kinds of incentives is enormous the um the overall um development in technology therefore that is happening both supported by finance as well as the intrinsic developments that are happening will crash prices down so i would actually i would take a, a an optimistic view and um, i would say at least 30% for me is conservative okay so 30% is the sort of thing which i'm hearing i heard it from mr jay kumar i heard it in some way from mr yes. asena mr gill is is a strict headmaster he's putting strictly but he'll be too happy i'm sure he's got a bigger figure in his mind and last coming to arvind what's your estimate yeah i mean it's looking like a poker table they have to increase the <laughs> <laughs> no 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 it's not a poker table <laughs> it's no, not a poker table and, uh, it's not a miss um, india contest the same question is asked to five they don't know what the answer is <laughs> from my side i think uh, from a commercial use case point of view i think i definitely agree with both kartik and jay jay kumar in terms of it has to be it will be more than 30% from a commercial um from a commercial use case uh, i mean personal still uh, maybe i'm not the right guy to answer it okay good good so you're saying 30% so you yeah. know what i'm seeing is you know today we are on virtually nowhere we are just 1% last year of the 15 million which was sold 1.4 lakhs was there so we are even at the most conservative figures we are talking of 15 20 and we're talking of 30 and uh, this is big leap but this leap has to happen across it can't be by arithmetic progression neither by geometric progression it has to follow the exponential route but it can happen if you have an inflection point you have a chain reaction it happens so we close this discussion on a positive note as they would say the woods are lovely dark and deep but we have many promises to keep and all stakeholders have to combine to keep the promises but if we miss this opportunity history will blame us so i believe all the stakeholders at 10 year 5 years later when we meet the people said those who became part of history or those who made history i believe india is in the cusp of making history let's close it on the positive note thank you all the panelists and thank you all the people who participated as audience and the questions thank you very much for the session thank you thank you thank you thank you mr malhotra for that fascinating discussion and gentlemen what a wonderful panel discussion we've had and uh, like like you ended i think there is a potential to pole vault and not just leapfrog for the industry to reach the numbers and the goals that we want to uh, reach by 2030 so mr sinha thank you so much for your time truly appreciate for you being with us mr gill as always thank you very much for your, uh, you know sharing this time with us mr jay kumar wonderful having you uh, having you with us and kartik of course thank you so much for spending time and and sharing your perspectives i think arvind has left but a uh, deep uh, sense of gratitude to him as well and mr malhotra as always always fascinating panel discussion thank you very much thank you much thank you thank you thank you, thank you. appreciate it thank you thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.